Good morning. Welcome to our online worship service. We're glad that you're joining us. I encourage you to sing, to hear the scripture, to spend some time reading the scriptures that we read, um, to pray. I encourage you to actively engage. Worship is not something that we can just watch. We must. It's something we have to actually do for ourselves, and I encourage you to do that. So in the spirit of that, I'm going to take a moment and let's pray together silently, um, asking God to, to bless our time. I pray that um, we would submit ourselves to him in worship, that we would express love and worship to him in this time, we pray. In the 23rd Psalm, David writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. From the love of my own comfort, from the fear of having nothing, from a life of worldly passions, deliver me, O oh God, from the need to and from a need to be accepted from the fear of being lonely deliver me oh god deliver me oh god and i shall want no I shall not want when I taste your goodness I shall not want when I taste your goodness I shall not want from the fear of serving others oh and from the fear of death or trial and from the fear of humility deliver me oh God yes deliver I shall not want, no, I shall not want. When I taste your goodness, I shall not want, no, I shall not want, no, I shall not want. When 
I taste your goodness, I shall not want. When I taste your goodness, I shall not want. I shall not want. I shall not want. Try. 
double meaning Heir to take us from a father's hand One by one the day the moment's fleeting Till I reach the promised land Amen Hello friends and family at Oakland Bible Church as you know, we're continuing to serve God in different and creative ways due to the suspended services. So what I would like to do this morning is thank you for your generosity. Many of you have given through the online giving opportunity that we have on our church website. You can find that at www.oaklandbible.org give. If you go to our website, there's also a tab that you can use if you choose to give that way. Another way that several of you have given is through the mail, and we would like to encourage you to continue that support. As we are struggling through this time and enduring through what has become the new normal during this COVID-19 outbreak, we continue to serve God. And we continue to do this because of your faithfulness. Again, we are so grateful for your support. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the church at Philippi, commended them for their faithful support as he continued the work of the Lord. And he wrote the following, But it's very good of you to help me in my troubles. You Philippians know very well that when I left Macedonia, in the early days of preaching the good news. You were the only church to help me, and you were the only ones who shared my profits and losses. More than once when I needed help in Thessalonica, you sent it to me. It is not that I just want to receive gifts. Rather, I want to see profit added to your account. There then is the receipt of everything you have given me, and it has been more than enough. I have all I need now that Epaphroditus has brought me all your gifts. They are like a sweet-smelling offering to God, a sacrifice which is acceptable and pleasing to him. And with all his abundant wealth through Christ Jesus, my God will supply all your needs. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. May God bless you as we continue to go through the suspended services, and may God provide for all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. We miss you, and we look forward to the time when we can resume the in-person services that are so important to us as a church family. May God bless you and keep you. Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of James, chapter 4 verses 13 through 17. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Thank the Lord for the reading of his word, and may everyone have a blessed day. Hi, friends. This morning I want to share with you a passage of scripture that talks about planning. Now, when we look at the last few months, most of our planning has gone out the window, hasn't it? As a matter of fact, our church year ends at the end of February. And we spent a lot of time planning a budget, anticipating what we would do in terms of ministry, the kind of things that we would seek to care for the church body with. And all of those plans within a month radically changed. We find that in life, don't we? So many of the things that we look at and we say, we're going to do this, we're planning for that, we're going to go and accomplish this, 
over the course of the next year. It's, it's good to set those goals, but there's a caveat to all of those goals, and that is if the Lord wills. You know, in the 1980s, yes, I was in college in the 1980s, there was a song by a Christian artist named Phil Keggy. And one of his songs was called Disappointment, His Appointment. And I want to share the lyrics with you. Don't, don't worry, I'm not going to sing it, but I am going to read it because I think it has some powerful thoughts that we can occupy our minds with. He shares the following. Disappointment, his appointment. Change one letter, then I see that the thwarting of my purpose is God's better choice for me. His appointment must be blessing, though it will come in disguise. For the end from the beginning, open to his wisdom lies. Disappointment, his appointment. Whose? The Lord's, who loves me best, understands and knows me fully, who my faith and love would test. For like a loving earthly parent, he rejoices when he knows that his child accepts unquestioned all that from his wisdom flows. Disappointment, his appointment. No good thing will he withhold. From denials oft we gather treasures from his love untold. Well he knows each broken purpose leads to fuller, deeper trust. And the end of all his dealings proves our God is wise and just. In James chapter 4, James calls us to evaluate how we plan. And he shares with us that often our plans won't come to be. But there's one plan that always comes to be, and that is God's. When we make plans and we choose not to include God in our planning, we're being very foolish. In fact, James calls it sinful in our thinking. God should be a part of every plan. So when we come to this passage in the 13th and 14th verses, James calls us to remember that God holds the future. And what he challenges us with is this, don't rely on the plans that you have for the future apart from God. Listen to what he says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Now, this sounds pretty normal, doesn't it? A lot of times, business plans include the idea of where we'll go, how we'll do it, what will be the goal of all of those things that we're shooting for, and we try to make a plan, but what's missing in this plan that, that James relays to us? What's missing is God. You see, what we need to remember is this. While we can make plans, they are always subject to the purpose and the plan of God. You know, sometimes we get this idea that the secular and the sacred don't relate to one another. The secular, the life outside spiritual things, we think, is something that has no relation to the spiritual. What James is calling us to is this realize that the spiritual should have a place in every facet, every part of our life. As the person that James gives as an example in this fourth chapter is making his or her plans, what they're saying is this, I've got this. I've got a plan. That plan is going to work. There are no variables, no problems. It's going to be because I am the captain of my fate. I direct what goes on. And they're being very foolish and really very sinful. We need to recognize that all of our skills, all of the things that we think that we've built on our own, are in reality things that God has enabled us to do. And we're being awfully short-sighted if we fail to see that. Paul said this to the Corinthians, and I'm reading from the easy-to-read version. Who do you think you are? Everything you have was given to you. So if everything you have was given to you, why do you act 
as if you got it all by your own power. Isn't that an important perspective? When we exclude God from the planning process, we're being foolish, we're being sinful. We need to also recognize this. We control nothing. When we look at this 14th verse, it goes on to say, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. We have no way of knowing what the next 24-hour section of our life will bring. We've seen that, haven't we, as we have seen this coronavirus affect so many areas of our life that nobody saw coming. We need to understand that we really control nothing. I can't control what happens in the next 24 minutes, let alone the next 24 hours or the next 24 weeks or the next 24 months. I won't go to the 24 years because we all know that that's uncertain, especially when you reach my age. So let's talk about what we control in light of Scripture. Scripture shares with us, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. You know, as this person is making his plans, what he's doing basically is saying that he controls what is to come. He will see to all of his plans coming to fruition What we need to recognize is there are many things that we think we control, but in reality, we don't. Look back at the 13th verse, and what we see is this. There are four areas that this person says, I have control over, and they're making the plan to see to all of those things being accomplished. Let's look at what some of these things are. First of all, He says this, tomorrow we will go to such and such a town. Now, when you think about it, travel is extremely hard to predict. You never know, especially in the first century, if you were going to encounter criminals, if you were going to encounter trouble on the sea or on the trail. You never knew what the weather might portend. You never knew whether... The caravan that you were taking would somehow not make it to its destination. All of those things are tenuous. And really, even though we have more effective ways of traveling today, you never know if you're going to be in an accident. You never know if there's going to be some sort of disaster that keeps you from traveling where you intend to go. A lot of variables. Another area, once the city is reached, it says this, Today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there. Now, once again, who knows how long we can spend in any given area. When you look at it, you could find that something happens in the town. Again, a natural disaster. When we look on the news and we see the many towns that were affected by tornadoes, for instance, uh, many of the people's plans were radically changed in just a few moments, as a tornado ripped through their town. No way to predict that. Also, when we look at the many who were planning to travel and conduct business out of the country. I spoke with a woman just this week whose children are caught in Spain. They were working, and their type of work gave them flexibility because they worked from their computers, so they decided to go to Spain, and they thought they would spend a week or two there, do their work, and then leave. Well, when the coronavirus hit, guess what? Travel was shut down. They are now quarantined, and what started out to be a very adventurous trip has turned into a different kind of adventure for them, and they're finding that things didn't work out the way they planned. Something else we see in this. We'll go there, we'll spend a year, and we'll trade. Now again, the idea of trade. We look at a model, we analyze data, we look at what we think will work out, and we make a business plan. Now there's nothing wrong with making a business plan, but here's the problem. We don't control all the variables. Another company could start up that does the same business better or more effectively, or just has more of a network or more connection. 
What we find is those people may or may not be able to conduct the business that we thought we would. We have to be careful to not fall into the trap of making plans apart from God. The last part of this is we'll make a profit. Wow. (laughs) Talk about something we have no control over. We can have all the pieces in place. We can have all of the things thought out. And what do we find? That profit that we thought we would make in our business isn't there. Too many variables to control. So what the Word of God is sharing with us is this. Don't be presumptuous. Don't be the person who says, I have it all planned out, all marked out. I have everything that's going to happen all in mind. My plan can't fail. Jesus gave this parable, and it's recorded in Luke chapter 12. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and goods. And I will say to my people, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared they will not be. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. We need to come to terms with the fact that we control nothing. And we need to accept in advance that God does. Now, when we come to verse 14, the second sentence, after James talks to us about not knowing what will happen tomorrow. He asks us an important question. What is your life? Now, this question is an important one. What he's doing is calling us to regain perspective on exactly who we are. And what he wants us to do is recognize that regarding ourselves, um, apart from God and just ourselves is foolish. Notice James says, again, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Now, this is a huge perspective builder. For many of us, we don't think about our own mortality. If we're given a diagnosis that we have a terminal illness, of course, we'll think about that mortality. If we have the potential of contracting a virus that could take our life, we might give it a thought. As a matter of fact, more and more people are looking at their own frailty and mortality as they come face to face with the COVID-19 virus and as they see people they know now being affected by the COVID-19. But here's the thing. Whether you contract a terminal illness or a virus that could potentially take your life, it doesn't really matter because at some point, all of us die. Now, I'm not trying to be morbid, and I'm not trying to be a downer, especially during a time like this. But what I am saying is this. All of us have a relatively short lifespan. And what we find is this. The things that we invest our lives in, our business, notoriety, many of the things that are apart from our relationship with God. What we find is this. Those are things that don't last. Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, shares some what could be depressing news for us concerning our own mortality and even our own legacy that lasts after our mortality when he writes the following Nobody remembers what happened yesterday. And the things that will happen tomorrow, nobody will remember them either. Don't count on being remembered. Oh, (laughs) here is Solomon, uh, a wise king. He built a tremendous empire. And as he reflected on all that he had accomplished 
apart from God. He looked and he said, meaningless. There's nothing there. In fact, in the second chapter of Ecclesiastes, Solomon shares the following. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this is also vanity. For of the wise, as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all will have been forgotten. How the wise dies is just like the fool. So I hated life because of what is done under the sun. And it was grievous to me for all his vanity and striving after the wind. You know, no matter how important we think we are. In reality, we aren't as important as we do think we are. That's why James asks, what is your life? He's asking us to consider what about our life is lasting and really counts? You see, the reality of our life is brought out in that last part of the 14th verse. For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. We have a limited lifespan. Job said the following, A man is born of a woman in a few days and full of trouble, and he comes out like a flower and withers. He flees like a shadow and continues not. Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths. This is from Psalm 39, verse 5. And my lifetime is nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather and then Peter in the New Testament said this, All flesh is like grass and its glory, like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Do you catch the sense of what James is sharing here? If I live a life that excludes God from my planning, from my thinking, from who I consider myself to be, I am living the life of of a fool by not including God, not just in my planning, but in every aspect of my life. The most important thing we can do as we navigate life is understand that there is a loving God that I can yield to as I make decisions, as I go through life, and he is the one that I will see at the conclusion of my life when I spend eternity with him. That's to be our perspective. Now, what we find as we come to verse 15 is further perspective. We need to revere God because he is the one who determines what will be. We need to recognize the truth that God's plans prevail. Look at verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. The will of God. We need to see this not just as God having something where we look at it and we decide, hey, I'm about to say something or do something, so I'll tack on the little phrase, if God wills, Lord willing, something of that nature. We need to understand that God's plans prevail, that God has a purpose and a plan that unfolds, and we in no way can come to the place to where we say, my plans will prevail. I love what Solomon writes in the book of Proverbs when he says this, The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man seem pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. And again, he says this in Proverbs 19.21, Many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. None of us will, can say this will happen with certainty. Only God can. Therefore, we need to rethink our plans in light of who God is. Look at what this 15th verse goes on to say. If the Lord wills, 
we will live and do this or that. If. What an important word. If it's the Lord's will, it will happen. Listen, God determines the course that we follow, that creation follows, that everything follows. That's why Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 1.11, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plans of him, now listen to this, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. God's will is what stands. And so, as a believer, how do I come to terms with that? How do I come to the place to where I understand that, yes, I'm to plan, I'm told to in Scripture, but my plans need to include God? I believe we come to this by pre-submitting to what God will bring into our lives by faith. Job said this while he was being tested, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. So how do we come to terms with it? Verses 16 and 17. Look at what they say. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. What we need to do is repent from the sin of arrogance and presumption. And in so doing, we need to refrain from refusing to acknowledge God's position because that's sinful thinking. Verse 16, again, it says we boast and have arrogance. What is boasting? Boasting in the original language means to speak loudly, to brag out loud. And then the idea of arrogance Arrogance carries with it the idea of wandering about. It was a word in the original language that came from charlatans who went around spewing their own thoughts and holding those on par with what God says. When we fail to include God in our purpose and our plans and submit to what God says will be, we are being foolish and we're being sinful. What we need to do is verse 17, and that is refocus our life on the good things that God has revealed. Listen to what the scripture says. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. God has revealed in his word the good things that we can invest our life in. We need to import that into every decision. We need to live it out, flesh it out, depending on the spirit of God to direct us in being obedient to God. And something else, often when we think of sin, we think in terms of doing things, committing sin, murder, stealing, adultery. Those are actions, and we think, hey, as long as I refrain from doing those things, I'm not sinning. But the Word of God brings something else out in this text. There are also sins of omission, those things that we know we ought to do and we fail to do. God is telling us that he has revealed in his word the good things that we are to invest our lives in. In our planning, we must include those things as well. This morning, we have seen the word of God share with us what we are to do in living out the things that God calls us to do. We're not to exclude him from our plans. We are not to go off and say, I am the captain of my own destiny. We are to remember that God has a purpose and plan that unfolds. And then I need to align my plan with God's plan. To fail to do so is sin. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to consider you in all that we do. Let us look to you as the one whose plans perfectly fit in to everything that you have for us. God, let us submit to you and your wisdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close by singing, Jesus Shall Reign. shall reign where the sun does his successive journeys run his kingdom stretch from shore to shore till sun shall rise and set no more Bless
blessings abound where'er he reigns the prisoner leaps to lose his chains the weary find eternal rest and all the sons of want are blessed to our king be highest praise rising and faithful he shall reign Jesus shall reign where he displays his healing power death and the curse are found no more in him the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. People and realms from every tongue dwell on his love with sweetest song, and infant voices shall proclaim their early praises to his name. To our King be high. shall reign. Let every creature rise and bring blessing and honor to our King. Angels descend with songs again, and earth repeat the loud Now, go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Honor all people. Strength of the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen and good morning.